You're listening to Level Up Game Product Managers Edition with Melissa Zalouf from IronSource and Joe Kim, the founder of Game Makers. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Melissa Zalouf, and you're listening to Level Up, the podcast for people who love making, growing, and of course, playing games. This week's episode is the sixth installment in our new mini series focused on game product management, and we're going to be talking about data infrastructure and analysis for free to play games. As per usual on this mini series, we're joined by my wonderful co host for the Level Up GPM edition, Joe Kim, who's the founder of the Game Makers blog and YouTube channel, and also by Victor Wang, senior product manager, and Andrew Wag, manager of data analysis both from NBC Universal Games. That's a mouthful. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for being on the show. Hey, Melissa. So maybe we could just get started by, well, first of all, great to talk to you guys again. It's been a little while since we were working together back at NBC Universal, and really glad you could join us. But for those in the audience who aren't familiar with you both, could we start by really quickly having you guys talk about your backgrounds and the kinds of games you have worked on in the past? Yeah, yeah. My, my name is Andrew Wag, and I've been doing uh, analytics for almost 10 years in various capacities and working on games for a little while. That's kind of been all over the place, mostly casual and mid-core puzzle games. Um, and basically, a lot of what I do is work on um, setting up the tracking in games, um, helping people get operational data independence, answers to the questions they need, and also... Um, doing big analyses to support our product teams and help people make better decisions. Yeah, and um, hey everyone, my name is Victor Wang. I've uh, been working as a PM in the gaming industry for the past three years now. Um, started off my career in gaming at a publisher called Scopely, uh, working as a PM on their Yahtzee with Buddies franchise. Uh, and really my focus there was to find opportunities where we could drive growth for the game through live operations. And in many cases, this included in-game event planning, personalized in-game experiences, segmentation to drive targeted offers, and really influencing the roadmap from the player insights we're able to gather from running daily events. Uh, it was a really great introduction to gaming and, and really what it means to be a PM on a successful live title. Um, fast forward uh, a year and a half, I decided to join NBC Universal to help build a new games publishing team uh, as our first product hire and got the chance to work on a number of different games. Uh, most notably, worked on Jurassic World Alive, which is a geolocation style game, uh, right when I joined. Uh, saw some pretty good success there, and more recently, uh, transitioned onto two other games in development. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Um, let's dive in. I thought we could start um, first by talking about dashboards and KPIs. So, at most companies, there are generally sort of standard and custom metrics being tracked across different games. Can you talk about the sort of um, key considerations that go into coming up with those standard metrics and what, in your experience, are some of the um, specific ones that are commonly tracked at different across different gaming companies? Yeah, totally. So, you know, before we rattle off a list of KPIs that you should be tracking, I think it's really important to understand two things. Uh, one, the overall purpose tracking KPIs serve, uh, and two, the goals and motivations of the different stakeholders on your games team. Uh, but overall, you know, KPIs are super important to understand uh, uh, about, you know, the three different things about your game, right? Um, retention, engagement, and monetization, which is basically the lifeblood of any game. Uh, depending on the style of game, the types of KPIs you look at can vary quite a lot. Um, for instance, if you're a company that is focused on hyper-casual like Voodoo, uh, the types of KPIs you would look at could vary a lot compared to a company like Playrix, which focuses on match three style games. Uh, but I think in my view, the most essential set of KPIs uh, serve the purpose of understanding business performance for the game. Uh, and this is usually of most interest to executive level management. Ultimately, these are KPIs that help game teams understand the relationship between LTV, uh, which is lifetime value, and cost per install. Uh, and this is extremely important to understand uh, as early as possible to know that you have an ROI positive game. Um, so when you break those two things down, uh, you can get, you know, under LTV, you, you can figure out what your retention curve looks like. So D1, D2, D3, et cetera. Uh, and Looking at that retention curve, you can determine the average retention days, which is essentially the area below that curve. Uh, and then on top of that, you can also look at average revenue per daily active user, which is arced out. Uh, and then sort of the combination of those two things is the LTV for your game. And then on the CPI side of the equation, um, you know, this is obviously how much you're spending per install. Uh, and then you can slice this up 
uh, into two different ways. You know, look at look at what your CPIs are by network and then also by campaign. So those are sort of the, the most essential set of KPIs, at least in my opinion. Um, the next set, set of KPIs uh, goes a level deeper in unpacking LTV. And it's something that product teams are interested in knowing uh, in order to monitor and optimize their games, right? So um, things like DAU, um, when you think about DAU, this is a function of your installs um, and your retention curve, which we, we just mentioned. Uh, and then on the ARPDAO side of things, you can unpack that down into pair conversion rate, you know, average transaction value, number of payments per pair, uh, those types of things. And then one level deeper, um, sort of the third sort of level is um, important to understand in-game player behavior and is something that game economists and designers uh, are interested in knowing in order to do their jobs well. So, you know, on the engagement side of things, things like session length and number of sessions, um, participation rates in certain events and features, on the monetization side of things, um, things like currency inflow and outflow um, by certain contexts within the game, uh, and then also conversion rate by actual package. So um, that is sort of uh, a full view on the types of KPIs that I, I think are fairly standard across most games. Yep. Yeah, and it just remember, of course, like at, at the heart of this, as, as you're thinking about this for yourself, really what you're what you're trying to do is understand product health and, and that's what all those are tools to help you accomplish. So just keep that in mind as, as the reason that, that you're doing all this stuff in the first place. And have you guys noticed um, kind of a, a wide variance in terms of what counts as standard um, at different game companies or sort of um, in different genres? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's probably uh Oh, for, for every five companies, you probably have seven standards. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there's there's some variance. I, I think conceptually, the, the metrics that a company decides to standardize on are, are going to be targeted at understanding game health and performance. And uh, the industry standard metrics give you the advantage of being able to compare your product to others across the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it easier to teach your, your coworkers what they mean, because um, many of them will already be familiar with how they're calculated. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as organizations mature, they tend to standardize their own metrics um, that serve their needs better. How, um, sorry for, for jumping in there, how often do you guys sort of um, set benchmarks or are there sort of industry, ben or I would say, I guess, genre benchmarks that you can and do leverage? Yeah, I think a, a tool that we typically use is App Annie to really just understand the landscape um, and sort of understand our competitors and, and how they uh, how they rate in, in terms of like retention and sort of monetization. So, I mean, from that perspective, App Annie is a fantastic tool. I know that a ton of people also use Sensor Tower to to really get sort of those benchmarks um, in order to to really set those targets. Cool. Uh, maybe shifting gears now and speaking about custom metrics, some companies actually don't do custom per game KPIs, but can you guys speak to when you do look at custom metrics? Like how do you come up with those specific custom metrics you should be tracking? Like when is it important to do that? Yeah, sure. I think one of the themes we're going to have throughout this whole conversation is making sure you're asking yourself the right questions. And so when you're thinking about this, um, you really need to ask yourself, you know, what are the things that need to go well or or need to not go poorly um, for your game to be successful? And uh, what can you measure that will help you understand how this is doing? And if you do need to measure something new in order to understand this, then that's a good indicator that um, you should consider making this a, a KPI for your game. Yeah, I totally agree with Wag. I think ultimately product teams should be asking themselves, you know, what are the things that need to happen in my product in order for it to be a, su a success? Uh, and if the answer to that question isn't currently being tracked, then it's certainly worth tracking. Um, and if you look even outside of the gaming space, you, you take a look at other successful tech companies and they have this notion of North Star metrics, right? Uh, and it, you know, when you look at Facebook, they obviously really uh, emphasize daily active users, which is something that obviously gaming uh, companies are super interested in um, optimizing on. But when you think about Airbnb, they optimize on nights booked. When you think about WhatsApp, they look at number of messages a user sends per day. Um, so there are definitely a lot of differences in, in the metrics that they track as well. 
Got it. And then can you guys uh, provide some examples or um, give, provide a little more context in terms of like maybe kinds of games or situations where you think custom metrics are, are critical or, you know, or maybe a class of games where you don't need them? You know, I guess one example that comes to mind are like more of the PVP based, um, you know, kind of CC based games, but, you know, just any anything else that you guys can think of? Yeah, I think almost... Almost any game is eventually going to want to have custom metrics as it gets more mature and sophisticated. I mean, basically, you know, early on, your your product is going to have its own personality, and and you're going to become acquainted with that as you start to get more and more data in. And so, at first, um, you're not necessarily going to know what to expect, but as you get more familiar with your product you're going to start realizing that certain kinds of behaviors are really important. Um, and you'll start identifying those over time and, and every game's different. So, um, I can't think of any exceptions where, uh, where you wouldn't have certain new behaviors that are really important to you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think in almost all cases, there's definitely a need to have custom metrics given how unique games have become over the years. But I think for games that don't have like complex in-game economies or varied modes of gameplay, like hyper casual, for instance, you could probably get by just looking at like standard set of metrics, uh, like retention, time spent in game, ad impressions per DAU, that type of thing. But it's when you get into games that have like much more complex economies with multiple currencies that custom metrics become more necessary to really understand in-game player behavior. And how fluid or dynamic do you find the sort of um, either the the KPIs or even the custom, I mean, custom metrics, of course, would be dynamic. But do you find that as you launch new features or trial something new um, that you're revisiting what KPIs you're looking at or sort of discarding them as as perhaps um, maybe not irrelevant, but but less helpful? I mean, yeah, yeah. As 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 your understanding evolves, um, your priorities are going to change and, and that's the kind of thing you should always be thinking about. But if, if they're chosen well, um, you know, as, as indications of game health um, and giving you an idea of whether you're succeeding or, or failing, um, you should probably only revisit them when you fundamentally change the way that you expect players to interact with your game. Um, and, and, and there are cases where that happens. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some new live events met those conditions and you need to revisit what you're actively managing and keeping an eye on. Um, but otherwise, uh, new features are more likely to have their own feature KPIs that can help you um, understand whether the new feature does what you intended. But but a lot of you know what you really want front and center in, in your conversations about your game is, is going to hopefully be constant if it's already in line with your vision. Yeah, and I think an important thing to, to really understand is sort of like what KPIs even stand for, right? Like they stand for key performance indicators. And, you know, if they aren't key to your understanding of the game, then like they shouldn't really be considered KPIs to begin with. So from that perspective, you know, KPIs shouldn't really change drastically, but only in the instances where a new feature really changes the way that the, the game is played. And, and that's something that, you know, Log is really alluded to. Got it. And for me, a kind of an interesting topic is around dashboard and sort of the scope of KPIs, because it seems like there are actually a few different schools of thought when it comes to that. So for example, one school is really focused on the very standard KPIs of ARP DAO, D1730 retention, ARP poo poo. And, and to, Victor, you mentioned some of the other sort of standard KPIs out there. So there's, there's that school. And there's a second school that has a huge set of standard KPIs that looks at just about everything. Then there's like a third school that has a dehydrated set of standard KPIs mixed in with uh, with a set of custom KPIs on a per game basis, and I'm increasingly I'm increasingly hearing more about a fourth school, which is basically only custom KPIs that are game dependent, and I believe the school of thought probably originated from Kabam and the sort of Jeff Howe regulars type of thinking. But in this scenario, even things like DAO or ARP DAO may not be on the main dashboard. Instead, it may be things like regulars DAO or DAC or something like those kinds of metrics. So basically trying to boil down a game into as few key metrics as possible and only focusing on those. But wondering if you guys could comment on 
you know, your thoughts on those different schools of thought and what, what are you guys proponents of? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's worth pointing out that all of these schools hopefully work really well for the people who are, are using them. And, and this is one of those, it depends kind of answers. And, and right. what I recommend really does depend on your organization's maturity. Um, and, you know, some of these questions you have to ask yourself as you're setting this up and uh, game KPIs are, are meant to un- help you understand whether your game is doing well. And if you're a mature organization or working on a mature game, you can, you can actually look at custom metrics in a vacuum and answer that question. But if you're just starting out, then leaning on these game agnostic standardized metrics will let you compare your new game to either your most successful title or using industry research, comparing it to other games that are out there. And that's a huge help as you're getting your footing. Um, and and f- f- it's also worth mentioning, you know, for the huge set of standard KPIs, um, it's a small distinction, but I, I'm, I'm in favor of having a lot of different metrics on hand, but not necessarily in favor of classifying those as um, KPIs and, and treating them like that. It's, it's kind of a semantic thing, but putting too many metrics front and center can make it harder to build strong data habits with your team and, and distract from some of the things that are really crucial. Um, so I, I just want everyone to bear in mind while we're talking about this, that game KPIs are diagnostic, sure, but they're also a jumping off point. And uh, if a metric doesn't truly make or break your game, um, you shouldn't be shy about putting it somewhere where, where people can look at it situationally. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is it obviously depends on sort of your um, your organization's sort of maturity in the space. But then also, in my opinion, it depends on like where you are in the product life cycle of your game. So I think, you know, the first school of thought, which is the very standard set of KPIs, um, I think it's a great approach for a game that's like in soft launch and understanding whether your product has market viability, um, since those are metrics that are commonly used to determine product health across uh, the industry. But sort of on the other hand, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, which is sort of the regular school of thought, uh, I think it's, it's a great approach if you have a mature product and that you found that it's got product market fit and, and that you have the data to support that those particular metrics are what you need to properly drive growth for your game. Mm-hmm. Now, let's say you're um, in a scenario where this is probably not unfamiliar to you. Um, you're the PM and you see it, you're seeing a metric which is lower than a target or a benchmark or, or on its way to dropping. Um, what do you sort of normally do? Can you walk us through kind of a, a typical scenario like that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, it, it, as being a PM, it, it's a situation that we're unfortunately all super familiar with. <laughs> but you know, before jumping the gun and assuming that there is an issue, I think it's super important to you know first verify that the data can be trusted. I think all too often game teams uh, assume that the data can be trusted and they go down this rabbit hole of investigating the issue only to figure out that there was a data fidelity issue. So I think just at the very start of it, um, it's super important to verify that there indeed is an issue by verifying the data. But you know, once the data has been verified, uh, you know, this is where root cause analysis can come into play uh, in order to really diagnose what the issue is. Um, so you know, let's say um, you see a drop in revenue, right? And again, this is something that PMs are super familiar with. Uh, you know, the goal here is to reduce revenue uh, down into its core components and see how those core components contribute to that drop. So, you know, when you unpack revenue, you can reduce that metric down uh, into DAU and ARP down, right? But, um, you know, there's ways to reduce those metrics down even further. Um, So let's say in this hypothetical situation, we see that ARP DAO is really where you're seeing the majority of that decrease. So from there, you can really reduce that metric down into its key components, uh, and you can reduce that down into payer conversion rate and average revenue per paying user, RPPU. Um, and you know, let's say you see the majority of that decrease is in RPPU. Uh, you can reduce that further down into payments per payer and average transaction size. Uh, and, and really the whole idea here is to just reduce these metrics down into something that's a bit more actionable. Um, and you know, let's say hypothetically in this situation that you see payments per pairs, you know, up by 20% and average transactions down by 40%. Um, now you have something that's a little bit more actionable that you can start investigating uh, on like things that have happened in the game the past day or so that might be contributing to those um, those fluctuations. 
uh, and sort of in this hypothetical situation, it could be very possible that, you know, a targeted offer um, campaign that you set off, um, you know, drove a decrease in average kind of uh, price, but then also drove an increase in payments, but not enough to offset the, the decrease in price. So, you know, this is a good approach in order to understand and, and diagnose issues. Um, and then from there, it doesn't really tell you what you need to do to solve that issue. And I think it's important that, you know, this is where PM intuition kind of comes into play. And, um, you know, this is where roadmap prioritization comes into play and, and really understanding sort of the, the live ops that you've been running and how you can improve that going forward. Yep. Yeah, that was a great summary. And then just communicate with your team. Like it's um, so important to just make sure everyone knows what's going on and, and you get through these situations together. Um, but, but yeah, it, conceptually, I think one of the things I've noticed as I've done, I think, as you've said, um, way too many of these investigations, a pattern I've seen as, as the person who's usually doing the investigating is that you, you tend to get to the heart of these problems by cleaving deeper and deeper into the thing that looks wrong. Um, so you'll split things out by platform. And if the problem is easy, evenly distributed across those platforms, then it's probably not a platform mm. specific thing. And, and you keep making those cuts until eventually, um, hopefully you'll find one thing that's basically dropped to zero while everything else is fine. And, and that tends to be the trick to really tracking those things down. It's interesting you, you guys mentioned root cause analysis because it's actually the subject of a podcast which Joe and I um, did together. How often or common do you think it is for game PMs to be leveraging root cause analysis to get to the bottom of problems like this, sort of intentionally as a methodology? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. You know, like I mentioned in my background, I started off at Scopely and this is sort of one of the key things that they teach you um, being a PM over there. So I can't really speak to whether this approach is used at other gaming companies, you know, having sort of that training, quote unquote, at Scopely has really served me well in sort of my PM career. But um, I mean, it, it's definitely a helpful approach because I think all too often you have these big problems that sometimes you you don't have the focus to really understand like how to unpack those problems. And using this approach really provides sort of that framework uh, to really dive deeper into to what that issue is. Mm -hmm. Um, and besides looking at uh, KPIs, what are some of the other things that you do to analyze the health of, of free-to-play games? Um, you mentioned, you know, PM intuition. Um, now, you know, metrics are obviously the, the science. Is there is there an art to it too? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and there's, um, you know, I think with a lot of these investigations, you are actually... Um, there's quite a bit of intuition in terms of where you look and how you interpret things. And, and the more context you have and understanding you have for how the game works, the, the better you're going to fare. Um, and that's, that's another part of why it's important to communicate is, is you have all these people who can help you understand this um, in, in addition to just avoiding, you know, causing a panic or having separate investigations. And so it's, it's important to mention that while, while we're focused a lot on game analytics specifically today and, and how you can use your game's data to understand what's going on. There's actually a whole bunch of other people um, who come from different disciplines with different pieces of the puddle, puzzle that can be tremendously helpful. Um, and so you have teams like hopefully a QA team, customer support, um, research teams, social teams, um, community and all these people have insight into what's going on in the game and effective organizations are going to find a way to really give them a voice. And I, I remember um, at one company I worked at really having a strong customer support team that had found ways to be involved in product and in, in production discussions. And, you know, we, we couldn't always find time to prioritize um, their requests just like with anything else, but, um, it was really important for those teams to have a voice so that we can make informed decisions about what was going on. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, at Scopely and at NBC Universal, whenever we have sort of these weekly retrospects to understand how the product's doing, we're obviously looking at all the game KPIs we had mentioned, but, you know, things like ASO, like understanding App Store optimization and the, the KPIs associated with that. So things like, you know, App Store rating, 
you know, the actual ASO funnel. So click through to install conversion, super important to have a, a view of, um, you know, CS, you know, as Wagus mentioned, something super important to track, um, you know, how quickly you're getting back to, 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 to complaints or, or users, uh, when they submit a CS complaint, um, things like you know, on the QA side of things, things like crash rate, number of bugs, these are all super important uh, pieces of the puzzle that you know game in game analytics aren't going to really help uh, solve for you. And that you know it's important to have a, a full view of those things. Great. So, final question on analysis for me is: How much do you guys actually consider cost, or how much should PMs consider cost when thinking about KPIs tracked? I mean, it's certainly really convenient for a PM to have every bit of data available, but then do you consider cost or have some type of events budget or cap like a, you know, um, X events per DAO or something like that to make sure analytic costs don't get out of hand? And I mean, to some degree, this depends on the telemetry solution you have and the cost model of that solution. But if you guys could speak more generally about that. Yeah, I think this is a really great question and something that I've had to consider more and more um, at my job in recent years. I think this is highly dependent on your company's data strategy and tech stack. Um, I think ultimately, you know, as PMs, especially if you have PL ownership, cost is always something that you have to consider, even though it might not actually fall under your PL. But, you know, being people that think about benefits and costs, you can't help but think about sort of that uh, as it relates to data. Um, I think what's important to understand is that like, as long as you're setting up your event telemetry uh, efficiently, which you should already be doing uh, because of the performance implica uh, implications of doing that, then it, it has trickle effects down uh, to cost. So I think from that perspective, that that's how we control costs as PMs. Yep. Yeah, a, a lot of times I've actually, I've seen the the performance implications of, of wasteful tracking hit home well before the, the cost implications come to roost. So, right. so that's, that's where I've, I've really seen that come in is, is if you've got some sloppy tracking, you'll wind up blowing up your database and your queries don't run anymore. Got it. And then kind of shifting gears now to more about data and in particular real time data. I mean, part of the, you know, um, data warehouse decision does come down to whether or not you need real-time data or near real-time data or not. Victor, I, I know you and I had this discussion as well back when I was at NBC Universal, and I'm probably part of the the smaller camp that doesn't really think that we need real-time data. <laughs> but, um, but I, I, you know, not that I don't understand some of the advantages because there there are certainly some advantages. But I wanted, I was wondering if you guys could speak to when and how do you use real-time data and what are those advantages, um, you know, and, and if you, you know, and, and what are the infrastructure implications if, if you are considering real-time data? Yeah, totally. And I remember having that conversation with you uh, back at NBC Universal. And, you know, at the time I used to be of the camp that real-time data was super necessary to have. Uh, and it was a luxury that I had at prior companies and didn't really have to think much about it. Um, but, you know, then I realized it comes at a significant cost uh, both from a monetary <laughs> and performance perspective. Um, you know, that being said, I, I think there's still a use case for having real-time data, uh, and that's to react quickly to concerning changes in your game um, that may break monetization or DAU growth. Um, so for instance, at Scopely, uh, we had a real-time monitoring system that would alert the product team, uh, literally through like text and like a phone call, uh, of any noticeable changes in monetization uh, or economy balances that needed to be addressed right away. So I think like from that perspective, you know, given that use case, the added cost of having that real-time data uh, definitely paid for itself. Yeah, it's a, a lot of when and where you need this stuff depends on what you're using the data for. And, and there are options where some things are going to be more or less real-time and, and other things aren't. Um, I think specifically if you're using it, really almost any kind of third-party CRM or push notification or game alarm service, um, those products have, have rightly you know, realized that real-time or near real-time data is really important for reacting and responding to things quickly. And so you may find that parts of your tech stack um, already have real-time capabilities where it's essential and, and that takes care of your biggest needs. Um, but otherwise, you know, how, how necessary it is depends on the maturity and needs of your organization. And I, I think part of the reason we're talking about this is we've seen a trend towards data being more and more real-time. 
Um, and also a lot of the technology that's out there um, is now built with that in mind where processing scales up much more easily. Things can happen more quickly in general. Data streaming is becoming more mainstream. Um, and so since it is getting easier and I think potentially more and more expected, it is still a good idea to be open to the possibility and leave the door open for that in the future. Got it. And um, now let's move on to talking about data infrastructure. Uh, what kind of components do you look for um, in infrastructure? What are the make major capabilities you need to have in order to support all of these sort of KPIs metrics, real time or not, that we've been talking about? <laughs> yeah, there's it's it's a lot to get your hands around sometimes. But but re remember that the the goal in all of this, all pretty much all this stuff we're talking about, you're trying to get data out of your game and get it into the hands of decision makers in a way that's going to be useful to them. And, and almost all of this is in support of that in some way. And so, you know, th there's a handful of essential components to this and, and they're essential in the sense that they're really the, the essence of the goal that, and you can't have a data pipeline without it. Um, basically you need to record the things that happen in your game. Uh, you need to discard anything that's invalid uh, you need to aggregate all of your valid data in a way that's going to be meaningful to a person. And then you need to, um, actually put the data somewhere where it can be viewed by the people that need it. And so what this means is that you'll need a data pipeline that has components for filtering, processing, and storing data, as well as a reporting or visualization mechanism of some kind. And so, um, those are the major elements. And, and one other thing I want to mention just to keep an eye out for, um, is how you're setting up alarms and monitoring. Uh, things things go wrong all the time, and, and having an automated eye on your data at all times can be one of the fastest ways to catch serious problems and, and bring them to your attention. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, and, and perhaps I'm saying this from like a selfish perspective being a PM, mm -hmm. but something that I always look for is uh, a system that allows PMs to be self-service as, uh, as much as humanly possible, I think. You know, when it comes to you know getting data into the hands of decision makers, there's obviously uh, um, depending on how you're set up, there could be this process that doesn't allow PMs to be uh, as quick as uh, they can be. So, uh, from a PM perspective, I'm always looking for ways to get my hands on data quicker. Yes, yeah, so so often as as an analyst, I I find that there's a very large need for data and and I'm in the way of a lot of that. And, and a big part of my job is getting out of the way in as many of these cases as possible and identifying the, the spots where people don't have independence yet and helping give them the tools to um, do all of these things on um, their own. Is it just a, a, right. a quick Go ahead. side note. Um, how often are there mobile app solutions for um, kind of accessing the data reporting and vis visualization components. Um, I think sort of on the one hand, we, everyone knows that we're now sort of, it's, I mean, it's a cliche to say we're living in an on the go world and you need to know everything all the time and you don't stop working just because you stepped away from your desk and certainly your game doesn't stop kind of, um, being played just because you're not by your, by your computer. Um, and yet I think a lot of the times people are accessing critical kind of, uh, data or information from kind of a browser um, in their phones. Um, do you sort of find, um, is, is, a, is mobile access important to you? And is it is it available? Yeah, so from my experience at Scopely, we did have the luxury of being able to access all the important dashboards for our games through our phones. And I think this uh, becomes increasingly important, especially when you have a live game that runs 10 live events every single day that you need to sort of keep track of. Um, it really allows you as a, as a PM team to be, um, to really track how things are going throughout the day without being in front of your computer. So I think like from that perspective, uh, it's super important to have that capability, especially for a live game and when things are like, um, when a lot of things are happening within your game on a given day. Got it. What, what about safeguards, guys? What, what kinds of safeguards should you establish when publishing data to just ensure that you will have high quality and valid data? You know, um, speaking to the data integrity and fidelity issue, um, generally speaking, you know, how does your data need to be transformed so that it, it is relatively safe? <laughs> that's, 
Wow, that's yeah, like that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> I, I think, it, but really, if if there's one thing that you need to figure out, um, you know, when you're doing all this stuff, that's it. Because when when your data comes through improperly, um, you can't build work on top of it, and it takes a lot of time to clean it up by hand, and it'll just bring your work to a standstill. And I've, I've seen teams totally get bogged down. Um, in just cleaning up the messes that, that come from this. Um, and and there, to give you the high level of it, there, there are a few hugely impactful things that you can do um, to improve data quality. And then that, you know, if you're listening to this, you can consider for yourself and think about how, how you're doing in these areas. Um, I think one thing it's less common than I would have guessed is um, if you can get your QA team involved in analytics QA to the greatest extent you can, that's really helpful um, so that you can have as many eyes on the data as possible. Um, you know, we, we have lots of people looking at the player facing part of the game, but the, the analytics side is also um, just as easy to break. And if, it's, if you're the only person looking at it, you're going to have a lot more mistakes get through. Um, so you can write test cases and, and give the QA team guidance on what areas to focus on with each update. Um, you can also make sure that the expected tracking for your game has been formally defined down to the data type. Um, and, uh, that'll, you know, make sure that your, the rest of your pipeline is prepared for, um, for all of that. Um, and that the things that, that you have coming through are as you expect, um, and, and you don't have all these calculation errors further down. Um, so. You know, as, as for how it needs to be transformed, um, key calculations that you'll need to, to do over and over again can be handled in the data pipeline to ensure that they're handled reliably over time, um, rather than, you know, done in individual queries where people can do things differently. And a, as your team grows, automating these important data processing steps ensures that everyone will get the same answer to any given question instead of calculating it their own way. Um, and, and this, this table aggregation, if it's done well, is also going to have the extra benefit of reducing processing costs and simplifying maintenance and troubleshooting and improving the performance of all your reports and dashboards that are downstream of it. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to that. I think, you know, Andrew's definitely the subject matter expert uh, on this particular subject. Um, yeah, if there's one regret that I have in, in terms of how we scale our sort of team, we, I, I wish we would have brought Andrew Wog on earlier to kind of address these things. <laughs> you know, he, he uncovered a ton of these gaps in sort of our process. Wait till you hear what he says in the podcast. From <laughs> um, and, and how you, how do you guys design for sort of, um, for obviously from a, from a data infrastructure perspective for multiple titles and for um, additional scale, um, you know, massive, hopefully massive user growth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, for, for multiple titles, the, the key is really to make your work as reusable as possible. I mean, building out this infrastructure, it's a huge pain. It can be tedious and slow at times. And, you know, but but the investment in all that infrastructure and those dashboards, it, it pays off as you're able to get repeat use out of it over time. And you accomplish this by standardizing your inputs as much as possible, building a system that's flexible enough to handle um, as many of those inevitable exceptions um, to your rules as you can. Um, so like as, as an example, um, you can avoid using game specific terminology in, in the names of your keys and your tracking and the, you know, the key value pairs that, that come through where you might have, you know, transaction name and it'll be, um, you know, character level up. So the, the key is, it, it could be called transaction name. It's the name of your transaction. Um, you know, th doing this leaves the door open for the tracking to be reused in other games. Um, you just need to make sure that the spirit of the tracking is, is the same across titles and that you'd use it the same way in analysis. So for instance, um, you could have a, a key in your tracking that's called combos created and for a puzzle game, you could use that to count the number of power gems that you create on the gem board. And in a fighting game, you could use it to count the number of actual combo moves that are, are used in either case. Um, and and this, this tracking can be used as an indicator of player skill at, at the core game. And 
it'll make it easier to roll your work from one game into the next. Um, even if they're fairly different titles, um, your, your dashboards and, and your data pipeline will already be pulling a lot of that information through. And, and you know, maybe maybe a third game doesn't need to use combos created at all because it's not relevant, and, and that's totally fine too. Um, but the point is you're, you're leaving the door open for as much of this hard work to get used over and over again because a lot of this investment really doesn't pay off overnight. You're, you're sinking all this time and energy into a system that's going to pay off in the long run and, and not require you to do a whole bunch of maintenance. Yeah, I think the key thing to stress here is having some, a system that's flexible, right? Um, so you're not duplicating efforts across multiple games. Uh, that's something that we had seen with some of our titles here. Uh, you know, being a PM on a subset of the games that we were publishing, you know, we, we did have a bit of a short-sighted view in terms of how we should be setting up our data infrastructure uh, to, to really meet the needs of those games individually rather than thinking about the, the grand scheme of things. Got it. And so at a high level, we've talked about both analysis and data infrastructure. And I was wondering if you guys could talk about kind of common mistakes or problems that people in our audience should watch out for, uh, starting maybe with the first topic around analysis. Yeah, I think the most common mistake uh, in analysis that I've seen sort of in the industry uh, is around priorities, right? And this is a word that's used a lot, uh, you know, in, in sort of PM speak. But I think like more specifically, you know, prioritizing the wrong type of analyses given the current state of the product. And ultimately, there are a ton of great questions to be asking about uh, our games. And the stark reality is that many game teams are resource constrained. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, so we have to be very methodical about the types of questions we want to prioritize and answering. And I think a good rule of thumb in determining uh, analytics priorities is to think about the important decisions you'll need to make as a game team. Uh, in the near future and the key data points you'll need in order to make the most sound decision. Uh, I, I found that this rule of thumb ensures that you're focusing on the right things and you're getting rid of any future bottlenecks in your development slash live ops process before they even happen. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's totally it. And I mean, if, if you're used to working on a product, um, one way to think about it is that you basically, you're, investigations need to have the same type of discipline that you've been applying to your product roadmap. Um, you need to be really um, diligent about prioritizing your time properly for, for as much as some of the questions you get on any given day are going to be fascinating. Um, and, and for people who are involved in game analytics, it's, it's worth pointing out that it, when this is going well and when you're really good at this um, and properly anticipating the questions that your team's going to have, this is where you actually get to have a lot of influence as an analyst because you're and and build a platform um, for your team and really have a voice and come into your own because you essentially get the privilege of framing and kicking off a lot of these conversations. If, if you're the first one to the discussion, um, you can really set the table and help make sure that your decision makers are going to have a productive time. Um, and are considering a lot of the right information, and it's really rewarding when it's going well. Got it. Okay, and now how about common mistakes with, with respect to data infrastructure? Um, I, I think if there's a theme, there's, there's really one major category of mistakes that comes in a few flavors, and it pretty much eclipses all the other mistakes, uh, and that's not spending enough time thinking about data infrastructure early on. Um, you know, it, or it, data basically, it, it tends to be an afterthought in the production process. And, and this tends to lead to unforced errors that require massive cleanup efforts and take time away from analysis. And a, a lot of this can be improved by thinking about when you bring analysts into the game, how you're going to involve them and what your expectations for them are. Uh, and, and so real world examples of this include, um, shoot, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert in, mistakes. Um, I have a lot of experience with it. Uh, you, you can, I mean, leave analytics out of the design documentation process, um, add tracking to your game um, immediately before or even in the release candidate build of the game without time for proper QA. Um, you can build dashboards without regard for the ongoing maintenance costs and find yourself in dashboard <laughs> maintenance purgatory. 
um, design the pipeline without fully working through the way it's going to scale. Um, but, and that's, that's a long list of random stuff, but if you get to the heart of what each of those mistakes are, it's that, um, you had other urgent things going on and you rushed a big decision. And like, like I said, these things pay off over time. It, it turns out your mistakes pay off over time too. Um, and you wind up paying this debt off, um, forever until you set aside time to fix it. And it's, it can just be a big mess that distracts you from, again, the most important thing in this whole conversation, which is using data to help people make better decisions. Yeah, I think the, the only thing I, I like to stress from that is getting data analytics more involved in sort of like the entire development process, like from pre-production to production to, you know, in all of those phases, I think something, um, that is often um, kind of not thought about initially is that, you know, when you're developing features, you really have to think about the types of, like even starting with event telemetry, like what are the things you wanna track when you're introducing this new feature into the game, right? So getting sort of the perspective of a, an analytics person involved in that process is, is hugely helpful. Right, and maybe one mistake I could bring up with you, Andrew, is is sort of the big one you fixed when when we were working together. Mm -hmm. So to your to your point about the general principle in terms of you know the common problem with data teams is just to get stuff done very quickly, not think about long term viability. So sometimes a data team may just throw data into a JSON blob or whatever and figure out how to parse that data out for visualization later. So that causes mm -hmm. all sorts of problems because everything isn't put into very fixed and you know, and specific data structures that are extracted cleanly in a uniform way. So I don't know, I call it an events and property spec, Andrew, I know you had another name for it, um, but you, you know what I mean, right? So can you talk about this issue and why it's so important? Yeah, you, you even got the name right. Yeah, we've, we've called it the event spec and I've seen that okay. terminology used fairly broadly. Um, but the <clears throat> basically the, the data from your game it undergoes a really long journey before it finally lands in a dashboard or report. And, and to get it to the finish line, you're basically building a giant Rube Goldberg machine to get it there. And if a single step fails, the whole process is in jeopardy. Um, and so data predictability is a key element of making this data journey a success. And if your data pipeline doesn't know what to expect, you can try to fight that with a flexible pipeline, but you're ultimately going to be in for a long and thankless maintenance struggle. Um, so to achieve this predictability, um, one of the things you can do with your team is to create a specification for the data that's going to be sent from the game, um, basically define what your tracking is going to look like. And you know this, this works in the same way that a car factory might have a spec, it's the same term. Um, there's certain tolerances that your product has to have in order to be allowed out of the facility and onto store shelves. Um, so having these definitions established gives your developers specific guidance on how to instrument the game, lets your QA team determine whether tracking is working as expected. So it makes all of this testable in a pass-fail sense of the word. Um, and it keeps wild data from contaminating your pipeline where you might have a uh, extra zeros get added to something and ruin all of your dashboards, or, or you might send a string where there's supposed to be a number and, and a job in your pipeline is going to fail. Um, so, so by discarding these events that don't match what you've specified, you can, you know, hopefully put them somewhere where you can see that it's happening and fix it. So it, it keeps you from getting into data quality debt too badly because you're addressing things as they come up. Um, and it also just, it keeps everything downstream from getting contaminated, which is just a time consuming and brutal proposition. Um, okay. As, um, as the last question, cause, cause we, we do have to wrap up. Um, let's do a, a hypothetical. If you could, each of you do it all over again. Um, and we, we have talked about mistakes. Um, uh, what approach would you go with from both a dashboards, uh, KPI perspective and from a data infrastructure tech, tech stack perspective? Yeah, I think we, we definitely talked a lot about some of the mistakes, uh, that are common in the industry and, and some mistakes that we've made uh, over here as well, sort of in our careers. But I think like Overall, if I could do it all over again, uh, I would definitely have brought Andrew Walk onto our team earlier, something I mentioned before, but 
uh, you know, since he's come on the team, he's definitely uncovered a ton of gaps in our data process. But I mean, speaking from a dashboards perspective, uh, we were definitely super ambitious with the standard set of KPIs um, that we defined across our whole portfolio. And I think given sort of our resourcing at the time, um, you know, it was definitely a lot to undertake um, just at the start. So I think um, if I could do it o over again, I would have just focused on the core set of KPIs that uh, we deemed as um, you know, important. So like things like retention, like the, the most basic set of KPIs you can think of to really just um, build better data habits, put more focus on the things that matter, especially given where we were in our kind of publishing portfolio. Uh, that would be sort of the, the number one thing from, uh, from my perspective. And then obviously on, uh, from a data infrastructure standpoint, uh, bring on Andrew Wag earlier so he can help fix mm -hmm. those things. Would have been what I, what I would have done. I, I hope it's not too obvious that I'm paying Victor to say nice things about me. <laughs> um, no, I, I think for for as much as you know, a, a lot of this has been. Yes, we've talked about best practices. We've also focused a lot on the big, scary problems to avoid. It's it's worth mentioning that for for all we've really emphasized a lot of the complaints. So overall, I'm pretty happy with how things have have gone on the data side um, for where we are as an organization, but um, there's still plenty to, to redo. Um, I, I think our, our dashboards and KPIs were more or less appropriate for the maturity of our organization, even if some of the dashboards came in a bit late and, and uh, we could have done a better job educating the team and driving strong data habits. Um, we still had a large set of standard dashboards available alongside the first production build of each game, which is a good milestone to keep in mind if you're thinking about this. Um, and we also built out um, our custom reporting prior to global, global launch, which is, you know, it's, it's really important to have everything you need ready for day one. Um, and we were raising the bar every time we launched a new game there, which is what you want to see, um, that, that you're really taking the lessons that you've learned and rolling them forward. Because I, I think the, the, the key to making mistakes is at least trying to make sure that you're not making them twice. Um, and, you know, I, I, yeah, no, that's that's my life in a nutshell. Um, I, I, I think the, the biggest thing I'd change overall, though, though, though it seems like a small detail, um, is to be more involved in setting up and monitoring the custom tracking on, on the games that, that we've been working on. Um, it, it would have been a big job uh, to do all of this up front, but you know, kind of one of the common refrains in this conversation is it would have saved us time that now needs to be invested into cutting tracking that fires too often, addressing blind spots that prevent us from doing analysis and reworking redundant or inappropriate tracking that causes data anomalies. Thanks, um, both of you. That's that's been it's been super interesting to chat, um, and I think probably very useful for anyone um, listening in. It's, I mean, before we sort of sign off, uh, there's obviously been, um, you know, things happening uh, at NBC Universal recently. Is there sort of, um, can you guys talk about that a little and um, and share kind of like what's next? Yeah, I think um, if, if you've been following sort of the gaming industry news, you may have already read that NBC Universal is shutting down its, its publishing, its games publishing business. Um, you know, Andrew and I are, are lucky to be on for the next several months, but there's uh, 50 some odd people that are, are currently looking for new work. You know, I mean, ultimately like this, this topic, it's worth considering as its own, um, podcast series. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the, the gaming industry is fundamentally project based. And that means that you have studios and publishers going under all the time as situation is changing. And that results in these same studios and publishers being reforged anew. And one of the things that really impressed me was the number of people who I work with who said, don't worry about this. I've already gone through this before. Uh -huh. um, and it's, it's um, one of the um, truths of our industry and, and a big part of what we are that, that's worth talking about. Um, again, as, as a separate podcast, uh, because I, I think it's, it's a very big and deep subject. Um, but, but t today, at least the, the practical side of all this is that, um, in the LA area, we do have a bunch of tremendously talented people, um, 
who are looking for work and um, more more generally uh, we, we have this phenomenon where um, regardless of your city um, it's it's great to see uh, the gaming industry always rallying around this news and and taking care of everyone so so we've, we've had some people start to find new homes and and others um, who are still looking so so we're grateful to everyone in, in LA who's who's helped uh, look out for everyone. Well, so anyone take note. Um, there are some talented people up for grabs um, and potentially a, a, another podcast series uh, or at least episode in there. Um, and and I think that all that remains for me to say is really thanks everyone for listening. Um, thank you, Andrew and Victor, for being on with us today. And of course, thank you as always to um, Joe for co-hosting. Um, make sure to tune in next episode, everyone, for more game product managers talking all things GPM related here on Level Up. Thank you.